May I preach to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I've come to understand that for some people, no matter what you tell them, no matter what you show them, no matter the evidence that is in front of them, they will not believe what you're saying. And the most, probably one of the most egregious examples of this was an article that I read about a woman in France who was officially declared dead in 2017 by a judge. Now, the only problem with that declaration is that she is very much alive. And no matter what she does, she cannot convince the judge or the government that she's not dead. She has literally stood up in a court and said, I'm alive. And they say, well, we need more evidence of that. Let's not get too hard on the French. I'm sure there's several cases of that happening in the United States as well. That was just the best article that I read. The story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ does not end on Easter Sunday. In fact, it only begins because Jesus must now go about to his followers, to his disciples, and begin convincing them all over again that he is who he says he is, that he is, in fact, alive. Now, let's not judge the disciples too harshly. Think of what they saw. They saw the one that they loved, their master, their teacher, the Messiah and Lord God, crucified. They saw his lifeless body placed inside of a tomb and a very large stone rolled in front of it. So when they see Jesus face to face, this isn't just shock. There's a little bit of disbelief as to how this could possibly happen. But Jesus now has to stand in front of them, in front of the whole court of the world, and say, it's me. I'm alive. I'm back for you. But how is he going to do that? Because he doesn't just have to prove that he's alive. He also has to prove that he is who he says he is, that he is the same Jesus Christ who was teacher and healer and the son of God. And that what the disciples see in front of them when they see this Jesus, this person who claims to be Jesus, is not just a reanimated zombie or a ghost, but in fact, the glorified Christ. Now, doubters of the resurrection are going to say a lot of different accusations about this. Not the least of which is, the disciples may have seen something, but they have to have been suffering under some kind of delusion, or hallucination, or grief. Because, from a probability and statistical standpoint, most people don't rise from the dead. So when they see Jesus, something is not going to fit very well in their minds. The fact that Jesus appears to them and appears to have walked through a door confuses me too. But think of how Jesus presents himself to his disciples. Later on, we'll see that, <clears throat> that he even eats with his disciples. <coughs> Not contagious. <laughs> that he will choose to eat with his disciples, cook breakfast for them, because ghosts don't eat. Zombies don't cook meals. But there's really two things. There's really one major thing that Jesus is going to do, and it's in today's gospel. And I'd like for you to open up that page in the gospel and, and look with me to see exactly what Jesus is going to do. Remember, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, is not just a spirit. He's got a body. How does he identify himself? Well, on that first day of the week when he comes in and he says, peace be with you, and he breathes on them, 
he shows them his hands and his side. Now, what were on his hands and side? The wounds that he endured in the crucifixion. And so even his glorified body still has the scars and the wounds that he bore from being crucified. But they're not bleeding. They're not disgusting. But they are real. Jesus shows this to his disciples, not just as an identifying mark, but also to remind them, this is how you last saw me. And it's okay. He says, peace be with you, because when was the last time the disciples saw Jesus alive? When they were running in the other direction. When was the last time Simon Peter saw Jesus alive? When he was denying him in front of everyone. So Jesus says, peace be with you. Now, of course, we're all going to pick on Thomas today. He's called Doubting Thomas because he refused to believe the disciples' story. But I want us to think about it from a different perspective. It's not that Thomas didn't want to believe the disciples. I think that Thomas was brokenhearted. How many of us would give anything to see someone whom we love who has died back in front of us in glory? We'd give anything. And if somebody told us that that was possible, we would want to believe, but we'd also want some proof because we don't want our hearts to be broken again by death. So Thomas issues the one test that he knows that the real Jesus is going to pass. He says, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. He knows that only Jesus Christ himself can pass that test. But why are the wounds still on Jesus? Well, first of all, it shows that it is his body. But second of all, it shows God's glory. It shows that Jesus is tied to his suffering. He is the one who obeyed God unto death, even death on a cross. And with those wounds come the same glory. So when Thomas finally sees Jesus, Jesus doesn't shame him for doubting. Jesus doesn't even, I don't think, blame him for doubting. He says, if you want to test it, go ahead and test it. If you need proof, here's the proof. And I think as we're going to be journeying over the next 50 days of Easter, trying to make sense of all the resurrection stories, Jesus is telling us today that it's okay if we have some doubts. It's okay if we find that some of these things don't make full sense to us. We can test it. We can go back to the scriptures themselves and read. In fact, it's one of the things I encourage people to do, is to go back and read the scriptures for themselves to see what it is that we're asked to believe, what it is that we affirm in the Nicene Creed every Sunday. Over the next 50 days, Jesus is going to invite us to stand and look at him as he stands in front of the whole world and says, I'm alive. Here I am. Because remember, the court of the world has stated that Jesus is dead that the resurrection did not take place, and that everything that the Christian faith has been founded on just didn't happen. So why is it that we believe? That's something that each one of us has to take some time on our own and begin to discern, because none of us are called to believe blindly. Today, my invitation to all of us is to go and pray and do our own work so that we can confidently approach Jesus and say, I believe, 
or I do not believe. I place my trust in you, or you are not worthy of my trust. Because if we're going to follow Jesus, it needs to be for the right reasons, not because he is a good moral teacher or because he is nice and fluffy, even though he's got a nice beard. It's not for any other reason than he is who he says he is. He is the one who has died for our sins, and he is worthy of our faith. I remember when I was in college, I had grown up in the Roman Catholic tradition my whole life, and I believed in God. But when I got to college, one of the things that I realized is that nobody was pushing me or forcing me to go to church anymore. <laughs> and so I confess here in front of all of you that there were some days where I just slept in. Or some days where I was just too tired from the party the night before. And over time, I began to realize, wait a minute, is it my faith or just a faith that somebody gave to me to hold on to? And that's when all the questions and the doubts flooded in. And I was so thankful that there were a couple of fellow Christians who took me under their wing and said, the opposite of faith isn't doubt, it's fear. Do not be afraid to ask God for faith. Do not be afraid to ask God to show you the truth. And over time, that's what happened. And I came to have an adult faith on my own. And so I pray that all of us here will have that courage and not be afraid to ask questions, not be afraid to share our doubts about Jesus and God, and be open to what God wants to share. And if in any of those moments you have questions that you can't answer on your own, there are a lot of great Christians in this church who will pray with you and listen to you. And if there's some deep theological questions that you may want to tackle, well, Father Richard here is the... <laughs> <laughs> you can come and talk to your clergy who want to have these conversations with you. I want to end this. I don't usually do this, but I'd really like to end this sermon with a prayer. So let us, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you have sent the risen Lord to his disciples to show them the way, to show them that he is who he says he is. I pray that those of us who have not seen the risen Lord face to face, but perhaps felt his presence in our hearts, might grow deeper in our faith and know that there is no question that we can ask, Lord, that you cannot or will not answer. And so I ask that you increase our faith, increase our courage, so that we might know and come closer to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.